There's issues in which that we want to fight for. It's important for us to talk to the community. And it's important for organizations to let people know about uh, what individuals actually really care about. So on the back, during the conversation, look at these different issues. Let us know what's most important to you, what things are not important to you. And then there's one aspect. If you can circle the three issues that, care, that you care most about, as we're having our planning conversations with the coalition, we'll be keeping in mind of those, of those issues. Uh, but before I begin, I, I do want to just uh, shout out a few uh, dignitaries who came uh, this, uh, this evening and feel free to have conversations with them because they're doing a lot of the work uh, that I'm doing as well down at the state capitol. Uh, and that's first uh, Representative Mark Cardenas from uh, Legislative District 19. If Mark, you'll stand up. <laughs> we also have Representative Ray Martinez from Legislative District 30. We have uh, Representative Acela Blanc from Legislative District 26. And right now in the city of Phoenix, there is a there is only one contested there is only one contested race for city council. Um, and we have uh, we're lucky enough to have Kevin Patterson here uh, who is running in Legislative District. And... So with that said, uh, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and. Uh, we'll start to really talk about the reason why this conversation is important. We know there's been conversations regarding uh, the school to prison pipeline. Uh, there's been conversations related to officer involved shootings. We know those are very prevalent and we just, you know, every single time you look at social media you see what's happening. We know that now with the, a new attorney general, um, who knows what to expect? You know, we have this conversation about law and order, bringing law and order back. So this is a timely conversation. And, and then here in the Valley, um, we just, just a couple of weeks ago, um, private prison contracts now within our jail. So this conversation is, is very prevalent. And today we have six amazing individuals who will talk to us a little bit more about criminal justice reform, um, and it's called Beyond Prisons, because we know private prisons and the prison industry is very important. But within criminal justice, there is no one silver bullet. It's a system. And in order for us to attack the system, we have to really have conversations about each incremental component of the system in order to create reforms. The agenda here is twofold. One, for us to gain more information from individuals who are daily involved in the work so we can use that in our workplace and our lives. And two, to specifically talk about direct actions that we can take. Many times we have both of these panels and we just have a conversation about the conversation. But make no mistake here today, we are really thinking about what ways and what things that we can do to actually take change to create reform. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. Um, and as I call the panelists, please uh, come up. I'll give you a short bio of them. First, we have uh, Will Guyana. And he will come up. So we'll join the ACLU as a policy um, director in June 2015. He's responsible for lobbying in the Arizona legislature on a broad range of civil liberties issues and leading key policy and education activities at the local level, especially in the areas of immigration rights and police accountability. Prior to joining the ACLU, he worked as a staff attorney with the Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence and completed a fellowship at the Arizona Center for Disability Law. He was a graduate of the Sandra Day the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State. Will. Um, if you want to slide over, yep. I'm gonna go another one. One more. All right. Next. Next, we have Luis Avila. Um, Luis uh, is the president and founder of Iconic Campaigns, a company that works to build advocacy, capacity, and organizations around the country. Uh, migrating in 2000 from Mexico, Luis stayed in the U.S. to attend college where he developed projects with people involved in arts, politics, and social justice. In 2004, Luis learned about voting rights in Jackson, Mississippi as part of the American Freedom Summer Program. He collaborated with organizers and leaders to advocate for the DREAM Act, fight against SB 1070, and challenging Sheriff Joe Arpaio's discriminatory practices in Arizona. Um, Luis is part of so many different organizations, including the National Council for La Raza and the New Teacher Project, a uh, dynamic individual, and I'm sure you will gain a lot from him. So again, Luis Avila. 
Next we have uh, Chanel Poe. Over the past decade, Chanel has been a champion for communities, children, families, and folks alike. As a young activist hailing from Detroit, Ms. Poe experienced firsthand the daunting challenges that can discourage individuals, especially those without professional uh, political or policy backgrounds, resources, and an influential Rolodex. Having come a long way um, from a child, Chanel is now the governing board member uh, in Boston. And she's also the president of the Arizona School Board Association Black Caucus, Chanel Poe. <laughs> now next we have Katie, and I'm gonna mess up her last name, but Katie Plasowskis. Um, Katie is the supervising legal clinic attorney for a post-conviction clinic at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. Uh, Katie is also the former executive director of the Arizona Justice Project, a nonprofit organization that represents indigent Arizona inmates who have been wrongfully convicted or suffered uh, manifest injustice. Um, after graduating from Howard University School of Law in 2008, Katie started working with the Justice Project as an assistant to the executive director, um, Katie Flasowskis. <laughs> Next we have uh, the Honorable Judge B. Don Taylor. Uh, Don Taylor is the chief presiding judge of the Phoenix Municipal Court and serves as a member of the Arizona Supreme Court's Task Force on Fair Justice for All. Prior to his appointment in 2015, he served for four years as the executive court administrator of the Phoenix Municipal Court. Before entering the field of court administration, he practiced law as a prosecutor in Arizona and legal officer at the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia in The Hague. The Honorable Judge Taylor. <laughs> We're going to have one more individual who will be joining us um, as well. He's, he's running a little late. Uh, his name is uh, uh, Mr. Benny Maxwell. And Benny, he'll have, he'll have an opportunity just to hear a little bit more about Benny and his story. Uh, he has been a major advocate for re-entry um, and has a lot of information that he can connect us with regarding families and also individuals who are uh, re-entering in society. So let's give one more round of applause to our panelists here. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So given the stark statistics, uh, it's not surprising that much of the discussion around fixing the criminal justice system really has focused on mass incarceration. Uh, about 2.2 million Americans are now behind bars. Uh, and federal, state, and local jurisdictions spend about $80 billion a year keeping them there. At the same time, we know that incarceration disproportionately affects the poor and communities of color. Why African Americans and Latinos make up 30% of our population, they make up 60% of inmates. But this crucial discussion misses another aspect of our criminal justice system, and that is specifically around the growing use of monetary payments such as fines, fees, and bail. So the use of fines and fees has grown dramatically in the past three decades. In 1986, 12% of those individuals incarcerated were also fined, uh, were, were fined uh, but by 2004, by 2004, that number had almost tripled. Um, Two-thirds of all prison inmates now have criminal justice debts. And also with that, we have 44 states that charge individuals to be on probation or parole. So this question is really geared toward um, Judge, um, Judge Taylor, and also um, Will, if you can dive in here as well. How has fines and fees been used in Arizona, and what effect do they have on the system, and what would reform, or what does reform look like? We'll start with you, Judge. The truth is, they've been used uh, poorly, is the best way to put it. Let me, let me go back a bit. You know, there's probably no one in the room who doesn't, um, who, who hasn't seen really the wake-up call that I think um, court systems across the country um, have had, specifically, I mean, really what set it off was, uh, was Ferguson. Um, and courts began to look at what was happening. Part of what came out of that was not just 
the DOJ's <coughs> report on, um, on what happened in Ferguson, but uh, a big report that the National Center for State Courts went in and did on the municipal court in Ferguson and the role that it played. Um, and I will tell you that reading that report personally um, was a big slap in the face. Uh, it, it was a wake-up call because that court, um, and they were not alone. And I, I preface this also by saying I spent two years living in, in uh, St. Louis County um, and saw firsthand a lot of what was going on there. Uh, but that municipal court was being absolutely complicit in what other parts of the system were doing. And some horrific practices you can read about in there uh, in terms of small fines and fees that spiraled out of control um, and that were continually growing and court practices that made it very difficult for anyone to get on top of what had been imposed. The court was doing things like, uh, you know, uh, fines and fees were being imposed the court would then have very limited hours that people could show up. They were invariably hours when people needed to be at jobs, um, other places. I mean, having the court open for an hour to, to take fines and fee payments was just silly. So, um, uh, horrific problems. Uh, the, it, let's talk a little bit about Arizona, because Arizona has very much gone through um, that process. The years on the judiciary in particular has very much gone through the process um, of taking that wake-up call, looking at it, and saying, what have we done to contribute to the problem? And the truth is, uh, I would say this is my own personal opinion, um, we have uh, contributed to it greatly. And it didn't start out, I don't think, as anyone looking up and saying, how do we create structural problems that really make it hard for, uh, for certain communities um, to, to navigate through the criminal justice system. We got there in a lot of different ways. But the truth is, even in Phoenix Municipal Court, up until two years ago, we were very good at collecting money. We were very good at imposing the fines and fees. Most of them the legislature has mandated and still continues to mandate. And we were very good at getting all of that money out. Um, one of the things that we have made, uh, I would say, an about face on in doing, and it is starting to take hold in other courts across Arizona, is saying um, we need to be partners in the back end of that process. We need to do everything we can as the court to make sure people are successful. And that any, for example, payment plan that we set up is something that's actually doable. And if a payment plan is not even an option, uh, that we make sure that things like community service options are available. And that we do everything we can to make sure um, that that is sustainable. Because it doesn't do anybody any good for courts to impose debt that somebody can't pay. Um, and we know that probably the biggest problem is that someone who can't pay, doesn't pay, ends up in a situation with a suspended driver's license. Um, and that is a ticket to oblivion. You know, I would imagine most of you drove here tonight. Because the truth is in Arizona, um, you, can't, you just cannot live. You can't get back and forth to work. You can't get back and forth to school. You can't pick up your kids. You can't go back and forth to the doctor if you can't drive. Well, we got hundreds of thousands of people across the state who have suspended driver's licenses, and that began as a result of not being able to pay a fine or a fee that was imposed. So, um, you know, I, I can really only speak for the city of Phoenix, um, but in recognizing that problem, we've made some fundamental changes in the last two years that are designed to make sure that we are trying to be a partner in that process and helping people be, people be successful. The biggest one, and I know I'm going on too much, but let me just say this because it's important to make people understand. That last one is the key, the driver's license. Uh, and so one of the things we've done is created a program that really is a path back to being able to get that license back immediately, which allows someone to be able to get the job, which allows them to be able to participate in, in life fully without that threat of you know, the criminal prosecution hanging over the head. Um, so far in Phoenix, we've had about 17,000 people to date that have come through the program successfully. Um, it's, it's working. One of the things we want to make sure people understand, and one of, the, one of the words that needs to get out in the community now is, we're here now, after a long time of not working with people, we work with people now. We want to be partners in this process to success more than anything else. Um, and I'll leave it there at the city of Phoenix. Definitely, and it definitely, definitely sounds like it's been a catch-22. You have a fine, you can't pay the fine, so you get a suspended driver's license, so then you're stopped with a suspended driver's license, and then again, the ball just keeps rolling and rolling. Well, I know you wanted to add something. 
Yeah, and certainly I think Judge Taylor uh, touched on a lot of important things. I, I just want to kind of take a step back. We're talking about fines and fees and bail. I think it's important that we kind of talk about what each of those things is. And so a fine is, is punitive. Um, we have a, a punitive system, and, and whether you're spending time behind bars and getting incarcerated for you know, whatever you've been convicted of, or um, it's something low level, and we've decided, well, you didn't really do anything serious enough to warrant incarceration, but we still, we still need to punish you in some way, so we're going to take money from you. Um, those are fines. Fees are costs that our legislature has shifted onto people who, in a, who find themselves in the criminal justice system. Um, we find uh, you know, we, we fund all kinds of things in this state through fees um, and pe for people who find themselves in court. Um, and these, this obviously tends to be people um, living in poverty, to be frank. Um, and so we're shifting costs as a state. Um, from taxpayers generally onto people with very low incomes. Um, and finally, bail is money for freedom. It's a price you have to pay if you don't want to be behind bars. Once again, the, you know, the thing these, all three of these things have in common is that they disproportionately impact people living in poverty. Um, if you don't have the money to pay your bail, you're staying behind bars. If you do, you're free. Um, if you don't have the money to pay your fines and fees, we're gonna you know, suspend your driver's license, we are going to send that to a private debt collection, um, we're going to impose late fees and we're going to do all these things. So obviously this is a system that disproportionately impacts um, people living in poverty. You know, Megan Cassidy of the Arizona Republic did a great series last year on this issue of fines and fees. And she has a story called How a $95 Speeding Ticket Turns into a $243 Obligation. Um, that original fine is $95, but once you go to court, you find you've got to pay for all kinds of things. You've got to pay uh, for a probation fund. You have to pay um, into the Criminal Justice Enhancement Fund, which goes to the Prosecutors Association, who then spend that money, our legislature, lobbying for harder laws, for new fines and fees, to lobby against bail reform and those things. People in the criminal justice system are paying for prosecutors to go down there and lobby for these things. Um, so it's, it's a terrible cycle, and, and you know, Judge Taylor, it was mentioned he was on the, the Fair Justice for All Task Force that the Supreme Court put together. Um, and and that, out of that task force came some great recommendations. The, the elimination of cash bail, um, giving judges discretion to you know, waive and mitigate fines and fees when necessary. Um, and, and so you know, what he said was, you know, I think the judiciary has stepped up and done our part here. And he's right. Um, who hasn't stepped up is our legislature. There were bills in front of our legislature this year that came out of that task force um, that didn't go anywhere. Um, they, they made it out of the Senate. When they got over the House side, um, a specific legislator held those bills up and refused to comment on why he wouldn't let them go through his committee. Um, just you know, speculating here, but I'm guessing you know some of those fines and fees that went to pay for certain lobbies is a big reason why those bills didn't move. Um, and, and so you know it's it's a problem that, that's been met. It disproportionately impacts people of color. It disproportionately impacts um, people of low income, of low means. Um, and it really, the solution is legislative at this point. The, the, there's only so much that courts can do. It's the statutes need to be changed, and it's it's on the legislature to make some changes here. Definitely, and you talked a little bit about the elimination of, of cash uh, bail, right? And we know that right, right now, within the last decade, the prison population, or well, the jail population, has increased by nearly 60%, primarily because, again, individuals, if you don't have the ability to pay for bail, then you are, you're sitting there um, and in jail. So, uh, and, and, and just, uh, if you could just talk a little bit, what was that conversation like for you to talk about sort of like the elimination of uh, cash bail? It's, uh, it's scary. It's scary because, uh, you know, the judicial system is something that moves very slowly. Um, and uh, that's a pretty radical idea because it's been ingrained in everyone in the criminal justice system for a very long time um, that, uh, that the really, you know, the purposes of bail have always been twofold. One is to protect the community um, and make sure that when someone who's arrested is released that they're not going to go back out and terrorize somebody. Um, and certainly some people will. But the second purpose of it has always been to ensure that somebody doesn't um, run out of the jurisdiction or that they return to court. And so it's a, you know, judges have always felt in that position that the option they have in setting that bail is really the only option they've got um, to ensure those two things. Because none of them wants to wake up in the morning 
um, and read in the paper that someone that they let out on bail um, actually went and committed a crime. And, and that's sort of the, um, that's, that's one of the things that drive them. And I don't want to make it sound like it's all about, the, about their image. They're also concerned about the safety. But understand that that's a very powerful motivator for them. So the idea um, that that's going to be gone, that money doesn't matter, um, really is counterintuitive. And so one of the big shifts that's, that is, I think, very slowly taking place is the judiciary is starting to understand um, that a much more important indicator is um, a risk assessment that doesn't look at money. It really looks at background and, um, and other characteristics of the individual to try and tell us that. Um, and judges have to come to grips with the fact that the, the studies that have been done that seem pretty solid suggest that money bail uh, really is not all that helpful. Setting that bond on someone who doesn't really ensure that they're going to come back. And so for my part, my belief is that it means that we need to be um, releasing a lot more people on their own recognizance. Um, and uh, we, need to be, we need to be ensuring, particularly at my level, the municipal court level, where a lot of people end up in custody over very minor offenses, um, we need to make sure um, that we are releasing everybody who needs to be released. And, if, and one of the things I've told my judges is, if we're holding somebody on a bond, um, it's because they have, for example, a very long history of failing to come back. So we really don't have much choice. Other than that, we really should be releasing people. One real quick yeah. before we yeah. change topics. Yeah. yeah, I just want to follow up real quick on, on that topic because, you know, in this country we all have, we're all entitled to a presumption of innocence. Um, we're innocent until proven guilty. Um, something like 70% of people in local jails in Arizona right now are, are being held pre-trial which means they're presumed innocent. We're all, almost everyone in our jails is presumed innocent, and a large percentage of them are there because they can't afford to pay bail. Um, and so that's a problem in itself, right? Um, I want to just briefly, though, touch on, you know, Judge Hiller mentioned risk assessments, and, and moving to a risk assessment system instead of a cash system. That's, that's a good idea, but like with all things, the devil is in the details. Um, and I think there's a big difference between a person who we think is genuinely a threat to public safety if they're released, and a person we're afraid may not show back to court if they're released. Um, and my fear is the, uh, that when we take these risk assessments and they're going to look at a number of factors, um, those factors are likely going to tell judges that um, the same people that are unlikely to reappear in court perhaps are the same people that couldn't afford bail to begin with. Um, it's going to be homeless populations. It's going to be people with mental illness. It's going to be people living in poverty that when the risk assessment tells them this person has a terrible credit score, I'm going to use that as an indicator that this person's not going to show back to court. Or we're going to be holding some of these same people who already couldn't afford bail. And so, you know, while, while I think it's, we're making great progress on this, I think we've got to be wary about anything new we're doing that could give us the same results that we have now. So, so one of the big topics locally and nationally has really centered around uh, school to prison pipeline. Raise your hand if you've heard, heard of that before. School to prison pipeline. A lot of us, right? Um, we know definitely when we talk about you know justice issues within our schools in the state and across the country, that's a big that's a big conversation. Uh, so, so Luis, um, when we say school to prison pipeline, what does that mean, and what what have we found? Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for the time. Thank you for being here today. Um, it's an honor to be speaking to you today, and I I I. I I think that it's sometimes this thing or this term called pipeline. Uh, we start thinking that people are take a long time to go from school to prison, right? Um, in many times, I call the school to prison lobby because it actually could happen the same day that the kid can get arrested in school. So, for example, 65% of the referrals for arrests in schools are to African American students in Maricopa County. 65%. Uh, when the population of African American far uh, is far less than that, right? For Latinos, it's about 36 uh, percent the risk of being arrested at a school. So when we're talking about the school to prison pipeline, sometimes we think that this happens in a long term, but in reality, it could be happening the same day that the kid could have brought a pocket knife that he found outside of school. Another thing we have to remember is that in Arizona, kids can be arrested as young as eight years old, uh, and they can be held. Uh, in juvenile detention as, as young as eight years old. 
we do have uh, still really harsh policies on juvenile detention, including uh, the new sheriff uh, uh, penzones uh, jurisdiction or prison or uh, detention facility for juveniles that still shackles kids when they are uh, in classroom facilities or move from one room to another. So we have really serious and draconian problems here in Arizona when we're talking about juvenile detention. Uh, not only as it relates to the education system, but also as the way that juveniles are uh, inter inter interacting with the system. A, a couple of things that I want to uh, mention before uh, kind of describing this with Professor Bible again, uh, Representative Walding, is that the number one reason that um, juvenile de defenders uh, say that kids enter the juvenile system is because of truancy um, or because of curfew. So either because kids are not in school or because they're not at home at the times they have to be. Unfortunately, this is the number one reason why kids are entering the juvenile justice system. And this number one reason why they're coming back, it's usually marijuana possession, um, which it's also could be uh, charged for a serious offense for kids, uh, could spiral, of course, this in the record of children uh, and juveniles for a long time. The School of Prison Pipeline, it's really the interaction and the mirroring of schools kind of trying to uh, have these really harsh policies and practices that mirror the justice system in schools. Things like having police officers in schools, uh, being able to discipline, discipline kids. It's no uh, surprise that, for example, uh, school uh, arrests have increased over 400% since the 1970s when we started the war on drugs. Uh, it's not surprise that uh, juvenile detention and incarceration has increased almost 300% in the last 20 years in communities of color. Uh, or that the major reason for kids to being arresting, arrested out of school is because they are suspended out of school. Mm -hmm. African American kids in Maricopa County, in, particularly in charter schools in Maricopa County, are eight times more likely to be suspended out of school than their white peers. Compared to uh, Latino kids who are almost six times more likely to be suspended than their white peers in charter high schools. But districts are also doing it. Um, in elementary schools, uh, African American students continue to be the most disproportionate population, particularly males, uh, to be suspended out of school. And we know that if a kid is suspended out of school in a hyper police community where there's a lot of police presence and not a lot of adult supervision, these kids could enter the juvenile justice system again. So it's this kind of relationship between the education system and the juvenile justice system that have kind of fed up of each other. We've kind of made children of color, special ed kids, and ELL kids disposable. Now we are creating a system of winners and losers, of kids who are exemplary and we want to celebrate, celebrate them and applaud them, and kids that if we find them challenging, we want to dispose of them as, hard, as soon as possible. We need more counselors in schools, we need better teachers, that are prepared, that are trained, and we need more data systems to tell us these things because we have no idea what's happening in our schools outside of the anecdotes that we get. We need more data for transparency as well to be able to talk about this school to prison pipeline that in so many states around the country they actually have factual information on an ongoing basis, and in Arizona it's just not in the statute. So the legislature has never forced the districts to actually release this data on an ongoing basis. So we have serious problems to solve this school to prison pipeline issue uh, that it's really uh, urgent, particularly in areas like the neighborhood where, we're, where we are right now. The Roosevelt School District is one of the most disproportional school districts in the Maricopa County area. The Mesa School District is one of the most disproportional school districts, and it's the largest school district uh, in the state of Arizona. We have serious issues, and we have to talk about them uh, as soon as possible. So, so Chanel, uh, what role um, do, do you see this playing, you know, as a governing board member in, in the schools in which you're serving and just broader, uh, again, as president of the, the Black Caucus? Um, yes, yeah, you know, certainly. So, you know, one thing we realize is that there is a high number of disproportionate suspension rates, but we also realize that there's a disconnect between our students and our teachers. And if our teachers are not aware of the environment that students are coming from, Instead of meeting them with discipline, they need to try to meet them with understanding. A lot of governing board members do not understand or realize the power that we do have to request that districts compile our student disciplinary um, rates by subgroups. Um, so that's a self-reflection exactly what the district is actually doing. And understand and realize there is a difference between a public elected governing board member and then a charter school privatized board member. Our, uh, our, our 
Um, transparency goes to the public. The public are, can hold us accountable, and they can also attend governing board meetings, which happens every month. You can find that on your district's website. You also can look at the meeting minutes. The charter schools, they can pick and choose who they want in their schools, and the governing board has the power and authority to dismiss your child. I'm also a parent of a 17-year-old who I have been glamorized by the charter schools at one point in time, and my son was one of those students that bought a Swiss Army knife to school because he thought it was cool. He wanted his friends to think that he was cool, and guess what? They dropped him real quick, no matter the amount of tears, and as a parent, I felt hopeless. I feel like there are a lot of other parents out there that too feel hopeless and feel like they have nowhere to go. So getting involved at your local school districts is one of the ways um, that you, know, you can help make a difference. Also, we're looking at policy. If your school district has zero tolerance policies, that's dangerous. They could put kids out at any step of the way. So if you are in a school district that has zero tolerance policies, I would encourage you to organize and mobilize your community and attend those district meetings and ask that they remove the policy. Right now, um, my school district, the Boss School District, we, you know, this conversation about equity started in 2015. It was something that was never brought to the board's attention. And there's been a lot of work behind the scenes for us to now get ready to implement a restorative justice center. Now see, back in my day, that was called common sense. But since sense is not so common, and we don't have teachers in classrooms that reflect the demographic of our district, that is where that huge disconnect is coming from. So best practices that local school districts can do is have implicit bias training for mandatory, for, stu for all staff members, including the administration. Another thing that they can do is try to, well, I would say this, we don't have um, school resource officers in our district, which is very, um, school resource officers are very problematic. Uh, we see more so black and brown students are being arrested at 98% will have any school resource officers in our district. Your assistant principal is the disciplinary, not the police officer. Um, so if you have a school resource officers in your local district, there is no data. Do you hear me? Since they've been in place since 1994, there is zero data that shows that student behavior enhances with having a police officer on campus. Thank you for that, Chanel. Um, Katie, I, I want to turn to you, because you, you work with uh, a, a really uh, group of population that often a lot of people don't, don't talk too much about, and that's juveniles charged as adults. So um, within that work, can you speak a little bit more to, to your work and, and the, the pertinent issues that are taking place with that? Sure. Um, so I work with juvenile offenders in the adult system. Um, all of the individuals I work with are in adult prison. Um, most of them have been sentenced to life in prison. Some of them have life with the possibility of parole. Some of them have natural life and will never get out. So part of what I've been doing um, over the past four years is, one, to um, identify who these individuals are. So who are the juvenile um, lifers or who are the juvenile offenders in our adult system? Um, of those juvenile offenders, which ones are serving, we call it natural life? which is life without parole. So those individuals um, right now will never get out. They will die in prison. It's a death sentence. Um, they can't even seek clemency. They can't seek a pardon. They can't even seek release based on imminent danger of death if they're dying in prison. Um, so it is, it's a death sentence. Um, the other group are the juvenile offenders serving life with the possibility of release after either 25 or 35 years depending on the age of the victim. Um, and then the other group are juvenile offenders who are serving time for non-homicide offenses, but they have so many charges stacked that the total time that they serve amounts to life. Um, so right now in the system, we've identified um, 35 juvenile offenders serving life without parole, um, which is natural life. There are about 100, probably a little over 100, serving just one sentence of life with the possibility of release. And there are several others serving consecutive terms that amount to life. So something we've been working on over the years is one, to get those juvenile offenders serving natural life resentenced um, under a recent United States Supreme Court decision. 
um, or hopefully through legislation to abolish juvenile life without parole in Arizona. Um, the other thing we've been working on for those juveniles who are eligible for release to make sure that the parole hearing is a meaningful opportunity to obtain release based on demonstrated maturity and rehabilitation. Because what we found is that these parole hearings, and these are kids who entered the justice system as a child. And when they turned 18, they went into the adult prison system and they literally had to survive in the adult system. And they've spent, some of them, decades in prison. And then they get the opportunity to seek parole and to go to the parole board. And so we've been trying to educate the parole board on the juvenile brain and that a juvenile's brain isn't fully developed like an adult's. They're therefore not as, cul as culpable as an adult. Um, and they shouldn't be treated like an adult or kids. And so we've been trying to educate the board on what that looks like and that these individuals should have a meaningful opportunity to get out based on rehabilitation and maturity. So we shouldn't be basing the decision on the crime. We should be basing it on whether this person has been matured and has been rehabilitated and is able to live a law abiding life upon release. Um, so, I mean, you know, as part of this work, we, um, we see what it's like in the adult system for these, really, these children, to, to these children who enter the system, and we're looking at programs that are available in the state prison system for these individuals um, so that they can be rehabilitated and, and hopefully someday they can get out. So, one of the things, too, uh, I know that a lot of people may have not known this with regards to parole in 1994, the decision. Can you speak a little bit to parole, how we no longer have parole? Uh, so, on, I don't know if any of you know this, but on January 1 of 1994, parole was abolished in the state of Arizona uh, for all offenses for all people. So, part of the problem that we had in Arizona was that there was a case that came down uh, by the United States Supreme Court in 2012 that said juvenile offenders should not be subjected to mandatory life without parole sentences. They said that the judge at sentencing must have a choice for a juvenile offender. And one of those choices must provide that juvenile offender with a meaningful opportunity to get out at some point in time. Well, in Arizona, when that case came down in 2012, we didn't have parole for all offenders who committed crimes on or after January 1st, 1994. Parole just doesn't exist. Um, so fortunately, through the legislature in 2014, um, a bill was passed giving parole eligibility to juvenile offenders only. But the adult offenders is a whole other issue. Adult offenders in Arizona, um, who have committed crimes on January 1, 1994, until the present day, even if they were sentenced to parole eligibility, right now they're, they're not getting a hearing. So that's an issue that hopefully you know, we can work on through the legislature. But. So uh, one of the things that I want to also highlight and talk about within uh, the criminal justice system uh, is uh, mandatory minimums. And some of us may be more familiar with those than others. Um, so, uh, again, this question is open to the panelists, and feel free, uh, Will, Judge, and anyone on the panel. Um, what, what are mandatory minimums, and you know, how do they play a role in criminal uh, justice sentencing? So Arizona's sentencing system is um, kind of an outlier in, in two ways. One is the kind of upfront stuff in that um, our sentencing code and the way that prosecutors are able to stack sentences and um, enhanced sentences with priors and things like that um, is very extreme in Arizona. Um, and in practice, what this means is people all take really bad plea deals because the risk of going to trial is enormous. Um, and so people are, are you know, in prison for years and for decades even because um, it would have been worse if they gone to trial because of our sentencing system. And a lot of that relates back to, to minimum sen sentencing, but enhancements and things like that. But the other side of the coin is that Arizona is also an outlier in how much of your sentence you have to serve. Um, in Arizona, we have truth and sentencing laws for both nonviolent and violent crimes that require people to serve 85% of their sentence. Um, Arizona, I believe, is either the only or one of only two or three states um, that has maintained that 85% threshold for both those categories of crimes, violent and nonviolent. Um, 
Some states have, um, there's, there are states where you only have to serve half your sentence even for violent offenses. And in Arizona, um, if you stole something and you're in prison, you're serving 85% of your sentence. Um, and so those two things kind of work in conjunction with each other to and, and lead to Arizona having the sixth highest incar incarceration rate in the country. Um, we currently have, I think, close to 43,000 people in, in state custody here in Arizona, um, in addition to, I don't know, over 10,000 people in jails, I think. Um, and you know, we now spend over a billion dollars a year on our State Department of Corrections. Um, at the same, if you look at the same time as correction spending has gone up over the past couple decades, where that our spending as a state has declined is in our universities. Um, it used to be a, 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 the fact that in Arizona we spent you know a billion dollars on our university system every year. That number is probably I think between six hundred and seven hundred million now. We used to spend six, between six hundred and seven hundred million on our prison system. That number is now one point one billion. So if you can see that. You know, with these policies in place, Arizona, the number of people incarcerated in Arizona continues to grow, and until we come back and address these sentencing issues, um, that will continue to be the case. And if I could just say one, you know, that, that addresses, I think, the felony level quite well. Um, but one of the things that sometimes doesn't get talked about is the mandatory minimum at the misdemeanor level um, that can have really horrific effects, um, and specifically in Arizona. Um, you're talking about mandatory minimum fines that by the time the mandatory minimum fees get added on you become um, outreach for many people. So for example, a, a first offense um, driving without insurance, the legislature has decided, is going to get you a fine that's close to $1,000. It's a civil offense, you're never going to serve any jail time, but the, the judge doesn't have um, any discretion. That's $1,000. And, and you want to talk about uh, another sort of mini pipeline, but it's the one that leads directly to the fines, fees, debt, servitude that Will was talking about. Um, it's, that's very easy for someone who, who, by and large in my experience, didn't have the insurance, not because they just felt like taking their chances. They didn't have the insurance because it's expensive, particularly in Arizona. They didn't have the means. That's particularly a person in a situation who's going to find that $1,000 to be uh, something incredibly difficult to get around. And so what that leads to is a failure to pay that amount. And as uh, Bowling was just saying, currently in Arizona, uh, the court doesn't even have a choice. If you stop paying or if you fail to appear on that, we have to notify MVD. MVD has to suspend your license. Driving on a suspended license is a criminal charge. You get pulled over on that, you can end up in jail. More costs, you now have a criminal record. So. It can start out with something as simple seeming as driving without insurance um, and very quickly escalate into someone who has a criminal record um, and can't drive, has more fines and fees on a mandatory level added in um, and, and finds themselves in the world of hurt. Wow. Um, and I think that that's one of the things in which is, is so important to our system. And, and you, you guys talked a little bit about policy and how those policies that, again, the legislature may or may have not enacted really ties uh, judges' hands uh, and, and things of that nature. Um, as you guys are thinking through, uh, and, and we'll, we'll circle back around to this, I do want to talk a little bit about some policies that um, you believe that we, can, we should definitely begin to, to tackle um, as, as citizens, as individuals in, in, in your field. What are some of the policies you see that uh, we should really be fighting for and pushing for? Yes, yeah, so I mentioned that earlier, any school district that has a zero tolerance policy, they need to eradicate that. That's gonna take um, activism from the community to stand up, but also start reaching out to some of your governing board members. All this information is public information. Once you log on uh, to your school district site, also to the school that your child or grandchildren are attending, um, you also wanna make sure that you, know, you are showing up. Particularly, I've read some stories lately about Black girls who are four times as likely to get suspended, feel free to look up Let Her Learn, which is a national campaign uh, by the National Women's Law League, uh, Law Council out of Washington, D.C. Um, girls who have their hair like mine, the way it grows out of my head, naturally. Students who have locks. Some of the terminology that you may hear used is that um, the hair is not well organized or kept. 
Um, again, that goes to show that there uh, is a disconnect between administration and understanding the culturally diverse schools um, that we serve. Um, another thing in policy um, is also looking at um, the fighting. Sometimes students end up getting into altercation with other students. It's inevitable to happen, especially at the K through eight level. But sometimes these students are being bullied and they feel as if the school district is not doing anything about that. If you're a parent and you feel as if your child is being bullied and the school is not meeting your needs, you need to bring that to the governing board level. A lot of times we don't get to hear a lot of these stories because they don't even get past administration. They don't get to us at the governing board level. Um, we welcome anybody uh, to come and speak at governing board meetings, doing public comment or also on a particular agenda item. But any policy that is alluding to natural hair, braids, uh, locks in their hair, those things can be um, detrimental. There, is, um, there was also recently, I'm not sure if you guys caught the article out of Texas, a school in Texas provided an award to a young black student and said she's most likely to get along with white people. So let's think about what that does to self-confidence and who approves something like that. I know that we saw, I believe it was in Missouri, a student, um, a teacher told students to let's treat back in the day as if it was slavery days and we're selling our students on an auction block and it's 2017. Um, again, it's going to have not only cultural conscious training, uh, but there also needs to be mandatory implicit bias and the system is going to push back. That's why it takes for parents and concerned members of the community to start showing up. If you pay taxes, you are a community stakeholder. You don't necessarily need to have students in a district, but our babies need voices that are there to help advocate for them while we have parents who are working two and three jobs just to make ends meet. Another thing that we're working on, you can hear how things kind of coincide, is that sometimes students are not eating in the morning and they come to school very hungry. We see students who line up 30 minutes before the school door even open because they're looking forward to that breakfast. We don't want students to be punished if they come in the classroom at lunchtime and they're not finished eating. Or if they're sitting in a lunchroom, the teachers are trying to um, ask them to throw away their lunch early. Because uh, we know that if students cannot concentrate, there is no way that they can think about learning. Um, and another thing, too, we want to keep in mind is that the um, adverse childhood experiences, that's something that we uh, consider ACES. Marsha Stannon from Phoenix Children's Hospital is someone who is helping lead that initiative. But again, if your local governing board is not asking about it, it ain't happening. So number one, we need to start looking at some of those local governing boards, and maybe we need to start getting up and running for office. Um, one, one thing also I want to throw to the panel, and after this question, we're going to open it up to questions that you may have in the audience. Because anytime we have uh, a number of people here, uh, it's really a, a great opportunity for us to give and get, right? Give information, but also get information um, and, and see if there's things that are top of mind that you are uh, really, that you really care about that we can uh, discuss. So I'm going to ask one question, and then after that, we're going to uh, throw it out to the audience if there's any questions that you may have. But one thing that's very important that um, uh, it's a major topic that, you know, I just remember uh, a long time ago studying about this, and that was prosecutorial discretion. And some people here may know what that means, some people may not. Um, but really the role and the discretion of a prosecutor to charge you or not charge you. Um, and and that's, that's, a, that's, that's, a big, that's a big stick to carry. Um, and recognizing, again, we have 95% of all of our cases are, are pled. Um, and they're in rank with, with our prosecutors and in some respect our judges as well. Can anyone speak just to prosecutorial discretion and how that actually plays a role uh, in, uh, in our criminal justice system? Well, as a former prosecutor, I will. Um, <laughs> that was the best tool. <laughs> uh, prosecutors have a lot of discretion. And I, I worked at, uh, at the misdemeanor level as a prosecutor. Um, and there was a lot of discussion. There was a, a lot of discretion. Um, my experience is that, that that varies quite heavily from office to office. So, for example, you know, the county attorney handles all the felonies uh, in the county attorney's office. And 
uh, policy, and I'm not here to criticize that office, that, but, but policy in prosecutors' often prosecutors' offices oftentimes is set from above. Mm -hmm. And so whatever um, prosecutorial discretion your line prosecutors have is often very narrowly drawn, uh, meaning they don't have a whole lot. So from the top down, it said, here's what you're going to do with these particular cases. Now, that's always been supposed to be balanced with the fact that the constitutional role of the prosecutor has been described by the Supreme Court as being a minister of justice, which means the prosecutors are supposed to be mostly concerned at the end of the day, in fact, completely concerned at the end of the day with justice being done and not just with winning. I'm not here to tell you that that's what they all believe in, but that is the principle that's supposed to be there. Um, but that's really, that's really where it begins and ends because um, you know the court system, the courts don't decide who comes into the system in front of them. Um, that is completely a decision made by law enforcement on the front end, um, and then by the prosecutors' offices. And so it's in that exercise of discretion. And it's, it's very often in those marginal cases of the determination of um, is this, you know, does this case have a reasonable likelihood of conviction or not, that that, that that power, I would call the power for good when it's exercised appropriately, can be exercised. Um, but that comes from the top down 99% of the time. And I think that means that the decision about you know, who you vote for as the, as the county attorney, as the chief prosecutor, what kind of policies that person is going to set, how they feel about the criminal justice system uh, is, is hugely important. So just to follow up real quick, um, you know, it's prosecutorial, prosecutorial discretion goes beyond just whether or not to charge someone, um, but it's also a matter of what to charge them with, how many things to charge them with, and what plea deals people are being given. And, you know, in a system where 90-something percent of cases are decided through plea deals, that's super important. Um, and, and just to quickly follow up, you know, Judge Taylor just mentioned, you know, prosecutors are elected, they're accountable to voters. Um, but there is a problem about kind of who has to internalize the cost of prosecutorial behavior. Um, in Arizona, we elect prosecutors at the county level, right? Um, and each county has a county attorney, and that person sets the policy for those offices, and that person is ultimately accountable to voters who will decide if they like that or not. But when prosecutors, let's say, take a very aggressive approach, don't exercise discretion properly, and are sending a lot of people to our prisons, the cost of that isn't just placed on the voters of Maricopa County. The cost of that is placed on everyone in Arizona, because as taxpayers, everyone in Arizona is paying for our prisons, not just the people in Maricopa County. And until we start to internalize those costs somehow at the county level, so that the people that are responsible for sending everyone, you know, the most people to our correction system actually are incurring some of that cost at the same time, I don't think we're going to see much change in prosecutorial behavior. So I want to jump it out to anyone who has any questions. I've seen this uh, hand right there. Um, so do you mind grabbing the mic right here? And then... Hello. Following up on what you both just said about uh, prosecutorial discretion, at one time in Arizona, there was a very robust program of diversion and pretrial intervention at the, at the uh, felony level. As a matter of fact, a lot of it was instituted with the approval of Dennis DeConcini, uh, now on the southern part, and Deputy Jacob in Tucson, and it was even here in Phoenix. And so what you're talking about in terms of discretion, that's sounds to be fairly informal and not really institutionalized. There was at one time a very institutionalized system where many more cases never, or had the opportunity never to become uh, a formal criminal record for the individual. They had opportunities to, to work it off, to pay restitution, things of that nature, much more. And, and with the, the uh, assault against crime in the whatever time, 80s, 90s, all that was washed away. Tremendous potential, I think. What do you see as the possibility, maybe with different county inter counties attorney, but for, for uh, a movement to have less incarceration through utilizing that very powerful tool at the county attorney level? Diversion programs are, are great. They're win-wins um, when they work. Uh, but again, that whether or not it exists is completely at the discretion. Um, 
the elected prosecutor, or uh, if we're talking about the level I work at, of the appointed, usually appointed um, city prosecutor. And, you know, you've got 26 different municipalities in, in Maricopa County at the city level. Uh, I know we've had diversion programs um, run in, the, in Phoenix Municipal Court for a number of years. Um, I, I can't tell you whether I've seen um, those sort of ebb and flow in the way that they've been used. Um, they can be very successful, but again, that's completely within the control of the prosecutor. And I know we touched on quickly, we talked about having that elected leadership. You guys should really research who's our county prosecutor right now. I've been in a room with this person and they promised that they will never ever prosecute a police officer who was involved in the officer involved shootings. So when you look at that type of direction and guided leadership that is starting from the top as we say and how it trickled down to affect everyday people, we need to be a bit more mindful when we are filling out our ballots and when we have judges like 26 that are listed on the ballot, whether we are keeping these individuals on the bench or are we sending them their packing papers? Because about that time, we got um, elections coming up in about 30 days, ballots will be dropping in your mail, so if I were you, I will pay attention to that. One thing I do want to mention too, Reginald, is that we wouldn't want to be remiss to talk about the largest incarceration that is located in 8504, which has the largest incarceration in the United States of America here in Phoenix. I'd like to uh, ask uh, any of the panelists, the judge or Will, um, re regarding both of you have mentioned the elected prosecutor, prosecutors and then the appointed prosecutor at the city level. There, there's a lot of discussion that prosecutors should be appointed rather than elected because they want to appear tough on crime because they're going to go for another elected office. Any comments or thoughts? So yeah, so that's certainly something there's a lot of discussion about. And I think you know if you look at the way, for example, in Arizona, um, with our merit-based system for judges, um, it's a system where judges are essentially appointed, um, but at the same time, um, they're eventually accountable to the voters, and the voters, you know, for those people that, that do flip over the ballot when there's you know, a bunch of judges listed, um, they are eventually accountable to voters. And I think there's a strong argument that, um, and, and you do see people using, for example, the Maricopa County Attorney's Office or other cross prosecutorial offices as um, a way to advance a political career. You know, let's not forget that um, Bill Montgomery's predecessor in um, the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, who is now disbarred, by the way, um, ran for governor after that, right? Um, and so, yeah, there, there is a desire to satisfy the, the, what people believe voters want. And as long as we have prosecutors who are elected and believe that voters want kind of quote unquote tough on crime policies, that's what they're going to get. Um, and so I think there is a strong argument for appointing prosecutors. Well, can you touch on uh, when a person gets arrested on the street? Do you hear an officer stand on the charge? Um, question again, um, when someone gets arrested on the street, you hear officers saying, I will charge you with this, and I will charge you with that. How does that uh, get advanced? Because um, a lot of times the officers seem like they're the judge, the jury, and the executioner on, on the street. But obviously it goes up the chain a, a little bit, so I would like to get a better understanding of that. And then you also mentioned that there was 43,000 uh, incarc incarcerated individuals in the state of Arizona. Do you have a breakdown of uh, race or ethnicity of, of those groups? Thank you. Sure, let me just start on that. So um, the enforcement decision and whether or not somebody's going to be charged um, it really happens in one of two ways. So at the level I'm at with it, you know, lower level offenses, um, the officers can actually write the complaint on the spot, and they do very often. So what you'll get is it's a, it's a traffic ticket. We've all seen them, I've gotten them. And on that traffic ticket, um, instead of it being a traffic offense, it'll list, for example, a misdemeanor assault, or a shoplift, or a theft. Um, it, it begins with them, it is filed with the court, it comes directly into the system. 
Now, at that point, um, it becomes the responsibility of the prosecutor, but it's already been charged. So um, the prosecutor's obligation at that point is to take a look at it, take a look at all the evidence in the case, decide whether or not um, there's a reasonable likelihood of conviction to go forward, um, and then either let it proceed or decide to go ahead and dismiss it. Um, the other way that it happens, and it happens, and this is almost exclusively the way that it happens at the felony level, um, is that uh, officers will go ahead and make the arrest, but they're not writing out the charging instrument on the spot. The uh, prosecutor is going to be reviewing it within, hopefully within the next 24 hours, because the person will be seen for their initial appearance within 24 hours. And by then, the prosecutor should have had the opportunity to review it and decide whether or not they're actually going to file charges. But to the, to the example that you mentioned, um, yes, there are things uh, that, the, that the police uh, absolutely start because they have the authority to, uh, to write that ticket to charge that misdemeanor um, with, uh, with the paper. Yes. Um, given the nature of, our, of Arizona and how uh, it, conservatism is deep in our bones here in this country, how do we, what is the relationship to, to changing people's minds where, you know, they can get on board that there's true necessity for criminal justice reform when racism plays a huge role in what's happening and we know how our people are in this, in this state. What is the coalition doing to address how do we reach people because we've we got to make a change in people's thinking uh, for true uh, reform for instance like the opioid crisis people are becoming even in real conservative states they they don't want to lock people up so how do we get that in other areas of the criminal justice uh, reform Well, I, I, I thank you for that for that question. I think it's a critical one. There has been efforts for critical uh, for criminal reform uh, in red states and conservative states around the country, and I think that one way that they've been able to uh, change policies or push for change has been creating coalitions uh, that are not fought by one group of people only. Right? Uh, the campaign that we are that we are um, fighting for called Demand to Learn. It's a campaign of the ACLU. Uh, the focus is to actually build capacity with communities of color, and that's where we're starting. So we are starting by giving all the data that we have available to African American communities, Native American communities, Latino communities, and special ed communities to show, uh, so we can learn uh, the, the data and the way that the, the issue is impacting us. And what we're doing is we're asking actually leaders in these communities, what do you see in common with the other communities that are being impacted too? And what we're all realizing is that We've been actually being taught about division and conflict between each other for so long that we are not even able to talk about our same problems at the same table. That has to change and has to change immediately. And the reason it has to change is because if we actually put together the communities that are most impacted by the, by the broken uh, criminal justice system in Arizona, by the broken education system in Arizona, the broken healthcare system in Arizona, then we can make a real difference. So what I invite you to do is to uh, continue to look, look at the data that impacts our own communities, uh, continue to talk to other communities about how it impacts ourselves and what issues uh, we want to be res see resolved. One question that uh, Representative Bolding asked is what are some policy solutions, right? And I've been actually really reluctant to come up with policy solutions because I think the answers are in rooms like this. So rather than me coming and saying we should do X, Y, and Z, what we want to do is have conversations with leaders like you, uh, with different communities and different backgrounds to ask what are the things that we need to be pushing for together. And one of the things that we're finding is that our communities are really wise. They are actually asking the right questions on the policy solutions when we are sitting together. When we are being informed, for example, that Native American kids that live next to reservations and going to district schools are up to 20 times more likely to enter in the juvenile justice incarcerate uh, uh, system, but nobody's actually fighting with them. So if they're fighting alone, they will never win. If we are fighting alone, we will never win. We have to create more bridges between our communities and being able to talk more about it because they've done it in other places. And the role of people, like the judge who's sitting in this table, it's important, not just at the municipal level, 
but judges at every different, at every level uh, in the state have to be involved in this conversation because they are the only ones who can make sometimes the case that this is an economic burden for the state. Sometimes they don't listen to us, and unfortunately we have to be louder and we have to be uh, together as well.